um, fab to see what Marlowe's all about, and uh, I'm meeting up with Graham and Sammy a bit later on this morning, so I'm looking forward to seeing them again as well. In the light of what David has just been saying about the reality of if we humble ourselves before God, and if we come to him and seek forgiveness and a fresh start, what we're doing at that point is not just something for ourselves, it's actually we're joining up with a movement that has been going on for thousands of years across the globe. We become one of the followers of Jesus, and we're about what Jesus wants us to be about in his world today. And that's really what this passage of salt and light is all about. It's what we're going to be focusing on this morning. So let me begin by offering you three brief stories. Story number one. Matt. Matt's been a person who's been attending church now for many years, committed follower of Jesus himself. He's involved in all sorts of things in the life of the church, a small group and various other activities that the church gets engaged with. Yet, when it comes to living out his Christian faith in his workplace, if he's honest, Matt would rather blend in than stand out. And when the church occasionally talks about that thing called evangelism, well, he remembers somebody once saying evangelism is a bit like a cold shower, invigorating, but to be avoided at all costs. He'd rather leave that sharing of the faith up to the professionals, to the Daves and Sammies and Grahams of this world. Matt works in Slough. Story number two. Onde. Onde's never been to church. Wouldn't call himself a Christian. It's had nothing to do with the Christian faith. But in the last few years, two things have occurred in his life which have made him begin to ask some questions. Some years back, he met a girl, fell in love with her, and Uh, They ended up deciding to get married, and on the journey towards the wedding, she wanted to be married in a church. He was not at all interested, but on the journey towards the wedding, he began reflecting on some questions around love and meaning. And then actually more recently in his workplace, just a few months ago, a young man died tragically of cancer after a six-month battle with it. And in Onde's mind, he's left with the big questions. What is life all about? What does happen when we die? Is there something beyond death? Onde works in Slough. Story number three. God is sitting in his heavenly planning room. And in front of him is a Mac, because all designers use Macs. And the grand plan of the universe is on the screen. And as he's flicking from one part of what's going on in the universe from another, a little pop-up message occurs in the corner of his screen. It simply says, on day, open. And at this moment, God smiles, as he always does, when one of the creatures that he has made is open to question. And a quick deft flick of his mouse, he zooms in from the grand plan of the universe to Onde and Slough, and God thinks to himself, whom shall I send? Three stories, Matt, Onde, and God. How might they come together? Well, as we turn to Matthew 5 to gain an answer to that question, let's bow our heads to pray and ask that God may speak to us through his word this morning. Father, we thank you so much for the Bible. Thank you so much for for the way in which you speak to us through it. And we pray this morning you would give us open ears, open hearts, wills that are quick to follow where you might lead. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So these verses from Matthew chapter 5 come in what's called the Sermon on the Mount, a a series of teaching that Jesus gives around a whole range of different subjects. He's just before our passage talked about blessed are those who, and he gives a whole range of people that are particularly blessed by God in God's upside down way of looking at life. And then he comes to these very simple 
images, metaphors. It begins with the one which talks about you are the salt. Uh, salt that actually can make a difference. Now, of course, in our modern day and age, salt is a very um, easy commodity to find. If we went into Marlow and you went to the local supermarket, uh, Sainsbury's, yeah, uh, Waitrose, yeah, Tesco's, well, you make your choice which one you go to, uh, and if you went in there, you would find salt, uh, plenty of it on the shelves. But of course, in Jesus' day, salt was not a common commodity. It was a precious commodity, a rare commodity. And salt, as we know, would have been used in the ancient world uh, to enhance the flavor of food and also to preserve things. And that's often what comes to our mind when we hear this phrase, you are the salt of the earth. But in fact, there is a deeper connection for us with this image of salt. Because if we go back into the Old Testament, what we discover is that salt is a symbol that is associated with those occasions where God makes his covenant or his agreement with his people. If you want to explore that further, look at Leviticus 2 or Numbers 18 to Chronicles 13, and you'll discover that salt is used as a sign of a God who keeps his promises forever. So when Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth, Yes, he's talking about enhancing flavor. Yes, he's talking about preserving, but he's also talking about something more. He is making a connection with the fact that we are called to be those who introduce people to a covenant, a promise-keeping God. We live in a world today where we're quite suspicious of people keeping their promises. In public life, when people make grand statements, we're unsure that they will actually keep them. We're not only often suspicious, we're increasingly cynical. But the good news is, at the heart of our faith, is there is a God who keeps his promises. A God who we can rely on. I've no idea whether you've come to church this morning as somebody who actually life is going well, you're on top of the mountain singing with joy and delight, or whether actually life is just tough and you're in a valley and difficult place. But what I do know is, whether you're on the mountaintop or in the valley, God is a God who keeps his promises. And the good news is, the good news that Jesus came to show and share with us is that there is a God of love who cares for every human being on planet Earth longs for them to be in relationship with him. The tragedy is we break our relationship with him by going our own way in the world. And the good news is he doesn't give up on us. He has made his covenant, his promise, his agreement with his people. And in Jesus launches his rescue operation so that we can be forgiven for that selfishness that Dave mentioned earlier on. Gain a fresh start enter a friendship with God and have a sure future. This is a God who will keep his promises, even to the point of his own son dying on a cross for us. And that same son, Jesus, says, you are the salt of the earth. And then goes on to say, but if salt has lost its taste... How can its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything, but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. It's interesting that uh, though another way that this image of salt is picked up in the New Testament, particularly in Paul's writing in the book of Colossians, he talks about us being salty in our speech, our speech being uh, full of grace and seasoned with salt. I'm glad he put it that way around. I, I do a bit of cooking, and I know that when I'm seasoning the cooking I'm doing, at the moment where I'm putting a little bit of salt in and the lid falls off the salt cellar and all the salt goes into the meal, it's going to be inedible from that point on. You see, being salt of the earth means that you and I are caught up in sharing the good news about this God who keeps his promises. We are the salt of the earth. We are called to be those who speak of this good, promise-keeping God, to be salty in our speech. The reality is that if we've come to our faith in Jesus ourselves, at some point somebody will have told us about it. 
And what Jesus is encouraging us here is you be the ones who tell others as well. Maybe it'll be in our workplace or in our community, our neighborhood, in a group that we're a part of this week, maybe in our educational context. We are invited to be those who speak about this covenant-keeping God. A little later on, I'm going to be telling you about the fact that we're in a fourth-generation non-church-going society. We have children, young people, and two generations of adults who've had no connection with church. But the good news is we are connected with those people in our everyday lives. And we are called by Jesus to be salt, salty in our speech, that others may come to know the promise-keeping God. And then Jesus goes on in this passage and he offers us another metaphor. And he talks us about us being light of the world and not hiding that light. Um, it's the season in the year where young people are going off to university. I remember three years ago, my elder son went off to university. And within about 20 minutes of him leaving the home, my younger daughter decided that she was moving into his room. Uh, she'd always had the small room in the house. He had the bigger room in the house. She decided that was it. He was gone. He was going to get out of that room. And over the next few weeks, we negotiated the move. Um, we did a little bit of decorating because she didn't want it to be in gray and black, which were the colors he had. She wanted slightly more lively colors than he had. Uh, we changed some of the decor. We also uh, bought a light from Ikea that she particularly identified what she'd like on her bedside table. When we got back from Ikea, we, and you know how it is with Ikea, you have to actually make the thing. So we managed to make this light up. We plugged it in. Light came on. I immediately then went downstairs into the garage, got a big cardboard box, went back upstairs, and placed the cardboard box over the lamp. Of course I didn't. That would be nonsense, wouldn't it? Why on earth would you go to all that hassle to get light and then cover it? Jesus says, you are the light of the world. Who would hide that light under a cardboard box? That would be nonsense. So let your light shine so that others may see your good deeds and give glory to God in heaven. So you see, just as we are to be salty in our speech, Jesus is encouraging us to be light in our actions, to not only speak the faith, but to show the faith as well. And again, I wonder what that might mean for us this week. In our offices, our places of work, the factory line, what might it look like to be light in our actions? Maybe it's that we're the one who cleans up the coffee point that everybody uses and gets a right mess by the end of the day. That certainly would be a good thing for us to do in my office. Maybe it's we take out the recycling that needs to be recycled uh, from the bins in the place that we find ourselves working. Maybe in our street, when we hear of that elderly person who's become ill, we're the one who takes the meal around to offer love and care for them. Maybe in our family unit, there are ways that we can be light in our actions to show something of what our faith means in practice. Because as people see our good deeds, they may give glory to God in heaven. Jesus is encouraging us to be a part of his movement, to make a difference in the world. And we do that by combining these two things, by being salty in our speech, being prepared to say something about the faith that we have, and by being light in our actions, so that we may show something of the difference that our faith makes. Do you know the smallest things can make such a huge difference in people's lives? That individual that we bump into this week is just clearly having a tough time. And we become their listening ear and assure them that we'll be praying for them as the week goes on. The smallest things can make such a difference. Be salty in speech. Be light in our actions. And then we're a part of this big movement that has been rumbling for a couple of thousand years. And you and I are living witnesses. We're in this building this morning because we've been impacted by the founder of that movement, Jesus ourselves. And he invites us now to share that same Jesus with others. Can I take you back to Matt? 
and on day and God in his heavenly planning room. And as the little notice pops up on his screen and God thinks to himself, whom shall I send? God smiles again because he happens to know that Matt works in on day's place of work and thinks to himself, great, on day, you're going to meet someone this week who will be salt and light for you as you begin to explore the big questions of what it means to be a human being on planet Earth. Ladies and gentlemen, there are on days in all of our lives when God in his heavenly planning room longs to send us. Small things can make a big difference. Let's commit ourselves to being light and salt this week. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you so much for those who have been salt and light for us in the years gone by. Thank you for the good news at the heart of the Christian faith. And we pray this week you may use us to be salt and light for others. Help us to show and to share the faith in whatever ways might be appropriate. Give us opportunities to do that so that others too may come to know you and glorify you, our Heavenly Father. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.